You want me to just sing to the video? Jesus, Jesus. What's that song? Jesus, Jesus, wonderful you are. Do you remember that song? That's Al Denson. Old school, yeah. If you have no idea who Al Denson is, don't worry. Nobody else does either. A, you're a child of the, well, this means you went to camp in the 80s, if you know who Al Denson is. Like, Al Denson, like, never heard of him. Like, well, if you were in the 80s and you were at youth camp, you did. Because that was before there was this big industry called Christian uh, praise music. There was Christian rock music then. It wasn't very good. Some of it was. Some of it was. And then Striper came out. We had Bumblebees. and Yeah, see, Dave is it's showing your age, Dave. All right, so now that I've ruined church, uh, and now that I've, we've had all that great worship, and then the pastor just... Mm, pfft, is, is Today we're going to talk about what to do when I'm confused. Some of you feel that way now after I spoke for just a minute. And so today we're going to give you some very practical things, how to listen, how to learn, how to live, and how to love. And, and I'm going to give you one statement. So if you want to nap, when you get home, your wife says, were you paying attention in church? You can say, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember when he said these words. Don't just do something. Sit there. What? Don't just do something. Sit there. Now, I want to tell you what I mean by that. <clears throat> I don't mean that if you're serving God, you shouldn't do anything. The Bible says faith without works is dead. But too many of us are thinking that it's about doing things. And we get so busy serving, so busy even helping people that we lose our focus. And we can begin focusing either on the tasks that we are doing for God or on the people that we are serving for God and we forget about God. So sometimes we just need to sit still. Sometimes we just need to take time to reflect and to sit in God's presence and to worship and spend time in God's word and to listen and let him speak to us. And if you think that's a new thing, nay, nay. Today, as we look in Mark chapter 9, you're going to see the disciples. Oh, boy. The same. You know, it's, you know what I love about the Bible? One of the reasons you know the Bible is true because here you have Peter talking to Mark, John Mark, and they're putting down uh, the gospel inspired by the Holy Spirit. And Peter's like, yeah, and then I did this. Yeah, and then that's when I did this. And so all through the book of Mark. Now, Mark, you remember, is the uh, Cliff Notes, like many of you studied in school, the Cliff Notes version of the gospel. And it was the first one uh, published, probably published in Rome, so that people who were not Jewish or did not understand the culture could understand it. And so as we look at this today, we're going to talk about this. But let me start with this. So years ago, I used to teach school. Oh, I was awful. I was awful mean. So uh, one of the things I did is I would give the kids a pop test. And I've told you about this. I would tell pop test. And they say, pop test. And then halfway through the test, I would raise the screen and I had all the answers on my chalkboard. Chalk is a substance that teachers used to use <laughs> before dry erase board. By the way, did you know it's all dry erase boards now? So you don't have the math teacher with chalk all over them. You got the math teacher with dry erase marker all over them. But other than that, the other thing I used to do is usually the first week, and I bet you some evil teacher did this. And Mike, I bet you, you did this knowing you're evil like me. I would give out a pop quiz the first week of school. And as I gave out that pop quiz, at the very top, it said... Before, the instructions were very simple. Before starting this test, read all the questions. Did you do one of those, Mike? He absolutely did. See, I knew. Evil minds. I mean, great minds think alike. And so, what it, would, it would be these terrible questions. It would be, I mean, I would ask things that no one knew. People, I would make up questions about Godzilla, whatever I wanted to do, and you would read. And then about the last one, you know, question 25 was, if you've read all the questions, make sure your name is on this paper and turn it in without answering any of the other questions. And so somebody who actually read the directions, it would take them about four minutes and they would read it, get to the bottom and go, oh, we love you, Mr. B. And then... I was Mr. B. By the way, I can still tell if I taught somebody because if I see him in Walmart or one of, our, one of my former students works in Lowe's. He says, hey, Mr. B. And I know Mr. B. If I see one of my seminary students, it's, hey, Dr. Brookins. 
Dr. Brookins, thank you. Thank you. It's good to have you here, Dr. Brookins. Good to be here today. And if I see somebody from our church, it's usually profanity, but that's different. Okay. So did I say that out loud? See, I'm sorry. That should have stayed inside. Okay. Number one, we're going to listen to Jesus and not the pastor. It's our first point today. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them to a high mountain where they were all alone. In another version of this story, he says to pray. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah, representing the Old Testament prophets. Okay, Elijah. And Moses, representing the Old Testament law. Right? Talking with Jesus. Now think about this. Time out. Do you realize the last time Moses was on earth before this? He was looking over into the promised land saying, I wish I could go there. And now, guess where he is? He's in the promised land with Elijah and Jesus. I mean, not only was this awesome for the disciples, but I'm guessing this was an awesome moment for Moses. As he's talking to the Messiah, the one prophesied about from the very beginning, Jesus, who is God, and they are on this mountain with sleepy disciples. And then Peter, who I like to think maybe was a little bit ADD. And the reason I say that is not because I'm ADD or anything, but it's because he was so impulsive all the time. So this is what he does. Peter says to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. You know, everybody likes the mountain, by the way. Everybody likes that spiritual experience. Wouldn't it be great if you could just sing songs all week and sit in place and just kumbaya, my Lord, right? And so he's like, let's do this. Let's put up three shelters. You know, let's build some tents. I mean, let's, let's make this permanent. Let's build three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Now I'm thinking, well, where is he going to sleep? But that's another story. He did not know what to say because they were so frightened. And many scholars think it's because he woke up and went, I got to say something. You ever say something when you shouldn't say something? Like I did just a minute ago. You ever do that? You ever say something when you should have just remained silent? Yeah, that was Peter. Listen to what happens next. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Listen to him. Even the disciples, when they were with Jesus, did not always listen to him. And the truth for us is many times, even though we're busy trying to do what God wants us to do, we want to be a good Christian, we want to do what God calls us to do, or maybe you're here watching online and you're not a Christian. But you've never taken the time to get still and discover who God is. To even pray, God, I want to know you. By the way, that's a prayer that God answers. I want to know the real you. We're going to talk about reading his word in just a minute. Let me show you a few things about this, just this section of this passage. Number one, you have to get away to pray. You have to get away to listen. And in their case, they were getting away from the normal everyday life to go up to a mountain, to get away. You know, they've discovered something about us as humans. Did you know they've discovered that your brain literally powers down? And most wives are like, yes, that totally explains it. But we've all had this happen where you've driven to work and you got there and you realized, I don't remember driving to work. Has anybody ever done that in here? You've driven to work and then you're like, how did I get, or you ever, like you lived in one house and you sold that house and moved to another house and found yourself at your old house. Anybody ever do that one? I've done that one. You drove to the wrong house or you were used to driving a certain way and the location changed and you realize, oh no, what happened? They say that our brains actually, when we do something over and over, actually power down. We don't pay attention. So I want to encourage you, listen, get a way to pray. Get away from your normal routine to spend time listening to God. The other thing you'll notice is that God has to say, listen to him. Why? Because Peter was focused on what he was doing. That was Peter's main problem, by the way. He was always focused on what he had to do next. Everything he did, he was like, that's next. And it was time to listen. 
No matter how hyper you are, no matter how unfocused you are, you can take time to get away and then listen. And then don't just do activities. Sit there. Don't, don't just get so busy doing activities. Don't just do something. Sit there. Too often we sit down to pray and we sit down to listen to God and all we can think of is all the things we have to do. Has that ever happened to you? Bring a piece of paper with you. Write those things that take a note so that you can put it aside and spend time in prayer. You know, when I first met Rodney years ago and really got to know him as I taught seminary class, one of the things I noticed over the years was Rodney always looked for those little opportunities to say yes to God. And one of the things I've noticed over the years and I have learned over the years is, hey, don't trust somebody in your life with something big until you trust them with something small. You know, the Bible talks about uh, uh, the parable of the talents. God says, hey, I'm going to give you some and see how you do with it and then give you more. Too often we think, well, if I just give them more responsibility, then I can trust them. No, no. Give them a little bit of responsibility. See how they do. You're calling a contractor to work on your house and they don't call you back. Can I tell you that might be a sign? They don't show up for your first meeting. Can I tell you get another contractor? You, you hear me? So be careful with the little things. And over the years, I've seen Rodney just listen to God and be obedient in the little things. When's the last time you took time just to get still and just to listen to Jesus? So we listen to Jesus. Number two, we learn in Scripture. Now, I want to tell you the kind of person I am. And by the hands last night, I think I'm not alone. I, I, I this is a confession. I do not like to read directions. I do not like to read directions. Listen, this is so bad that there was an a insurance company that in the middle of their big contract, you know how they do those things that you're supposed to read online and I say accept, accept, accept? There's a lady who in the middle of the contract won $10,000 because after months, she was the first person that actually read that. They gave her, the insurance company gave her $10,000. Just read that story this week. I can't even read the instructions for my grill. Because I think I'm smart enough to put it together. So I get the grill out. This, this happened just recently. I put the legs on and I say, oh, that's going well. And I know this piece goes next. And of course, I'm looking at the drawing. I'm not actually reading. I, you know, the drawing's good enough. It's on the box. It's good. And I go to put this next part in and I realize it doesn't fit. And so instantly I think, well, they've sent me the wrong part. It's got to be their fault. It can't be mine. And then I look at the instructions and realize that I've put two of the legs on backwards. And so now I have to take all of the legs off and start over with what I was doing in order to put the next piece in. Why? Because I never read the directions. Listen, too many of us, too many of us are trying to say, I want to be a Christian. I want to follow God. I want to do what God wants me to do. But we never read the directions. And when we do, we're surprised. Like, oh, it says that? Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. You talk about some awesome gossip that you couldn't share. Like, do you realize what we just saw? I mean, I'm sure they looked different when they came down. They were probably a little freaked out. Thomas was probably like, what's going on? They're like, I doubt you would understand. Had to throw the little doubt Thomas in there. They kept the matter to themselves discussing what rising from the dead meant. So they still had no clue. What does that mean? Is it, is it an analogy? They asked him, why do the teachers of the law say Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, to be sure, Elijah does come first and he restores all things. Why then is it written? By the way, Jesus always went back to God's word. When, remember when Jesus was confronted by Satan in temptation? What did he do? He went back to God's word and said, this is what the Bible says. That the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected. But I tell you, Elijah has come and they have done to him everything they wish, just as it is written about him. 
I want to encourage you to spend some time in God's word every day, but not just spend time in God's word to read it like you would a regular book. It is not a regular book. It is a book inspired by God. And if you're a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit within you so that when you read a verse, when you read a story, when you read a chapter, it will come alive to you. That's why every once in a while somebody will say to me, Eric, when you were talking today, it was like you were in our house. I actually had Somebody get mad at me that years ago and they said, my spouse told you what happened this week. And I looked at them and said, absolutely they did. That's why I did that sermon. I did it all for you. And then they looked at me really strange. I said, I'm kidding. I have no idea what's going on in your house. But God does. And so as I read that verse, if that struck you, it's because the Holy Spirit in your heart is saying, here's the deal. So we have to spend time daily in God's word. So listen to Jesus, learn in scripture. Number three, live in faith and prayer. So Jesus comes down the mountain and the disciples had tried to heal this demon possessed kid, all kind of bad things. And they couldn't, they couldn't heal him. And so this man who was there, the dad started even doubting that Jesus could do it. So when Jesus comes back, he's like, Hey, I would love you to heal my son. If you can. And you can hear Jesus' voice and intonation in this simple statement. If you can, said Jesus. And then he said this. Everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me to overcome my belief. Listen, if you don't hear anything else today, hear this. Some of you, the best prayer you could pray is that. God, I'm struggling in my faith. God, I'm struggling in this. Would you help me to overcome it? God, I, I don't want to forgive that person. God I, God, I don't even want to want to forgive that person. You know, you've like two steps away still. Help me to overcome that. God, I'm struggling in this area of my life. Help me to overcome that. God, I'm struggling with my faith in this area. I just got a bad report from the doctor. Help me to overcome that. God, I just went through this tragedy. Help me to overcome my lack of faith. God, I'm worried about what's next. Help me to trust you. So he says, help me to overcome my belief. And then a few verses later, after Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind can only come out by prayer. And in some versions, it says fasting. And here's the deal. When you spend time in prayer, God gives you the power you need to do what he's called you to do. Now, this verse is not saying when it says everything is possible, it doesn't mean if you pray, God, help me to fly, that you're going to be able to fly this afternoon. I mean, unless you get on a plane, then maybe that'll work. The truth is that everything is possible means that when you walk in God's will and you pray in God's will, that he can do anything through you inside of his will. So when you look at these verses, say, God, would you help me with my faith? Would you help me to understand that it's not even, by the way, it's not about perfect faith, right? This guy looks at Jesus and is like, um, okay, I'm not even believing the right way, so could you help me to do that? Sometimes that's all we need to pray. God, I'm not even praying well. Would you help me to walk in faith? What's your first response to a problem? Worry or prayer? If we're honest, usually our brain goes right to worry. We're really good at it. Some of you watched the news this morning. Probably the biggest mistake you could have made, right? Just gave you, it, it's, it's like the news says, here's something to fear today. Oh, that's a good start. Let's start with that. How about something to get mad about? That's next. Coming up next, something to get mad about. Next time you listen to the news, listen to what they say and just say, now something to be afraid of. Now something to be mad about. Just, just repeat what they say and say that out loud. You'll laugh. You'll laugh. Just start saying that out loud. Now something to freak out about. Coming up next, something atrocious. You should be horrified, right? You know? and, and that's what they do. Why? They're just trying to make money. They don't want you to walk in faith. Can I tell you what walking faith is? One of my favorite faith stories is a, is a true story about a guy who was a tightrope walker. And one time he did this great uh, feat where they, they did a rope across Niagara Falls. Now, I don't know which side. I, I don't know if it was the Canadian side or the American side. If it, I, I think the story would have had a couple of A's in it if it was the Canadian side. They strung the rope, eh? <laughs> By the way, can, I love the way Canadians say sorry. Have you ever noticed that? Sorry. They say sorry. That's how, that's how you can tell that Michael Jai Fox is a Canadian. Because any movie he's in, he says sorry. 
You can't say sorry, just so you know. That has nothing to do with the sermon. Anyway, so they're, they're at Niagara Falls. He's got a rope across. This guy's a tightrope walker. He walks out, walks back. He gets a wheelbarrow. He walks out, flips the wheelbarrow, you know, kind of dances on the rope, comes back, and there's a reporter there. And the reporter says, you are amazing. You are phenomenal. You're the most amazing tightrope walker I've ever seen. And the tightrope walker looks at him and goes, you really believe that? He goes, oh, yeah. He says, okay, get in the wheelbarrow. To which the reporter goes, nay, nay, no, no, you know, I don't trust you that much. And the truth is, a lot of us trust Jesus from a distance. But when life is hard and things don't go well, and you go through a tragedy or a struggle, Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. I wish he had said might or could. He said, you will have trouble. But then he says, but he's overcome the world. So God, I put my faith in you knowing that you can overcome even this in me. God, even this struggle that I have, you can help me overcome. So spend time in prayer. So finally today, listen to Jesus. Learn in scripture, live in faith and prayer. And then finally, love through humility and holiness. Now these sound like two totally separate things, but they're not. Because here's what I want you to know. All sin is selfishness. And all selfishness is sin. Now, I'm not talking about taking care of yourself. That's not selfishness. But I'm talking about when you only think about your desires. And the enemy will always lie to you and tell you that, hey, you need to fulfill this desire in order to be happy, fulfilled, peaceful. Whatever the sinful desire is, he always puts it out there. Whether it's something big, like a, maybe a drug addict who, who, who the enemy is saying, hey, you need this drug to make you feel happy. Or if for you... It's just two more hours of Facebook, right? Or three more binge watching of this show. Or no longer talking to so-and-so. Or hanging on to that unforgiveness. Whatever it is, the enemy will always tell you, you have a right to that selfishness. Can we say, God, I only have a right to what you want me to do. Listen to what happens next. So, so they're walking a little bit later. <laughs> I love this. And Jesus looks at the disciples and goes, so what have you been talking about? Like he doesn't know what they've been talking about. By the way, anytime Jesus says what you've been talking about, he already knows what you've been talking about. I mean, when God says to Adam, hey, so what's going on? Where are you? It's not that God didn't know where he was, right? So, but they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. You ever feel like you're better than somebody else? That was the disciples. The disciples were like brothers. Well, some of them were brothers who were saying, you know what? I think I deserve a little better spot than you do. I got my act together. You know, I think I deserve to have that, that seat right next to Jesus. I, you know, you're, you're going to be down a little bit because, I, I mean, I saw, you, you know, you tried this, but it didn't work out. And... Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve. And he said, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child whom he placed among them. And taking the child in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. Your baby just cried on cue. That was perfect, little. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. What Jesus is saying, this word child can also be servant. And what Jesus is saying here is, how do you treat the people who can do nothing for you? How do you treat that waiter or waitress who can't help you? That person as you go through the drive through How do you treat that person in traffic? Oh no, I didn't have to say that out loud, did I? The person that, when I stopped at the red light down here, blew their horn at me right after church. I was having a Jesus mountain moment. And then I wanted to build an altar and throw the rocks at the person. Right? How quick we change when we start thinking we're better than the people around us. It causes us to not be able to get along with others. Because we think we're better than they are. Hey, let me give you a hint. Okay, more than a hint. 
We all need Jesus. None of us have our act together without him, but with his power, we can accomplish anything he calls us to do. It's not about us. And then Jesus says this, if anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. Can I tell you, as a church, we should always care about children. We should, we should care about children who are kidnapped and are victimized and are hurting. Jesus cared about the children. And if we have the heart of Jesus, we should. It's one of the reasons we always go out of our way to serve and to help and to be there for children and for families. One of the reasons we house homeless families is not just for the parents. It's because we want to be a part of these children's lives and making their lives better. And then he said... If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to go out with two hands into hell where the fire never goes out. Jesus talks about a literal hell. And what's he saying here about our hands? Poke your eye out, cut your hand off. What does that mean? He said, hey, he, he's making a great point by saying, hey, don't sacrifice the long term for the immediate satisfaction. Don't sacrifice how God wants to use you down the road by sabotaging something close to you. Those little choices. Be careful what you watch. Be careful what you read. Be careful what you spend time doing. Why? Because if you want to make a difference in eternity, it's moment by moment in the choices you make. And if you don't know Jesus, if you're watching online or if you're here, I want you to know there's a very real hell in the scripture, all through scripture. But there's also a very real heaven. And so this week when I had two different funerals, I was able with confidence in both funerals to say, we don't have to grieve as those with no hope. Because the people that have gone before us are with Jesus. That is the reason that we need to not just do something, but sit there. So that in these moments, we can listen and we can learn and we can love and we can live the way God has called us to live. Now, I want to give you some very practical, a very practical way to have a quiet time. So I want you to think about your quiet time. Think about your daily time in God's word. If you don't have one, that's okay. Uh, you're going to think about one. What time should you have it? I want you to think about that time. And then where should you have it? Now, at my house, I have an office. <clears throat> I'm so excited. I have a chair that I just put in that office. It's actually comfortable. Sometimes I sit out on the porch for my time with God. But I like air conditioning, and I'm spoiled. So I like to sit inside if I can. And so I go inside. I get my cup of coffee because I'm addicted. It's my confession of sin right there. I said to my wife this morning, you know, I'm drinking three cups. She goes, yeah, but that includes your afternoon coffee. I go, oh. Four cups. She said, what? I said, four cups a day. She goes, oh, I didn't know that. <clears throat> I said, well, you have a drug addict in your house. I'm sorry. So I get my coffee. I get my Bible, which is usually on my phone. Sometimes I use a paper Bible. Remember those paper Bibles? Before that, they had tablets. I'm so glad we went to paper. And now we've gone back to tablets, which is weird. But anyway, different kind of tablet. So I have my Bible. Sometimes I have my daily bread. It depends what I'm doing. Sometimes I use my utmost for his highest. Other times I just read through scripture and I take my coffee and I have my phone with my radio. Sometimes I put on a pair of headphones and I listen to worship music. And I get still. And I read God's word. Sometimes I read through a book of the Bible. Maybe I would read the gospel like Mark since we're reading through Mark. We read that, that chapter maybe every day or read a part of that chapter every day. And then say, God, speak to my heart about what I just read. And then I take some time to praise him for who he is and thank him for what he's done. I sometimes use acts. If you heard me say A-C-T-S, I take time to adore God. I take time to confess sin. I take time to be thankful. And then S is for something called supplication, which means I pray for my needs and I pray for other people. I always end my prayer time praying for other people. And then I've usually finished my coffee. I've had my time in prayer. And I walk out of the room and I say, God, I want to act on what you've given me today. Now that I've sat and listened, now 
I want to do what you've called me to do. So start by sitting there and not doing anything and then do what he's called you to do. Walk in faith. If you're here today or watching online and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, I'd love to talk to you about what it means to have a relationship with him. To realize that you're messed up and broken, what the Bible calls sin, that you're a sinner. But that when you confess to him, the Bible says that when you confess that you need him and you surrender your life and your sins to him, that he takes all of that. And the Bible says he does the great exchange. He gives you his righteousness. And the reason that Jesus died on the cross is because none of us have it together and it's a payment for sin. We needed somebody else to pay our debt. So when we surrender that to him, we say, Jesus, thank you. You died on the cross for me and rose again. I receive your free gift of salvation. Cleanse my heart. Help me to understand what it means to walk with you. When you make that decision and not just know in your head about Jesus, but you really surrender your life to him, he changes you. He gives you his Holy Spirit, which makes you a different person. If you've never done that, I want to encourage you to do that today, whether you're watching online or here, and let us know about it. Also, if you're here and you want to talk about it, I'll, be, I'll go outside after the service so we can take our mask off. Talk to you about what it means to walk in Christ. The other thing I want you to know is this. I understand when I share a message that in the middle of the message, God may have spoken to you about some specific thing. Hey, don't leave it there. Be obedient to him. Write it down. Take action. We welcome the little children and I pray that we would be like little children when it comes to our faith. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Thanks for being here. Father, thank you for these moments. Thank you that even in the middle of our busyness that we can get still. That, Father, in the middle of the frustrations, in the middle of the heaviness, Father, that we can get still and take time to be thankful and grateful and love you. Lord, in a world full of chaos and hatred and anger, I pray, Father, we would be so full of your love that we would know how to love each person. That, Father, you'd give us the ability to love the unlovable, to forgive the unforgivable. Lord, to even look in the mirror and thank you that you love us. So, Father, I pray that would be true for the folks here and those who are watching online. Help us to get still before you this week. In Jesus' name, amen.